Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvellously well. It's my great pleasure to be interviewing Mr. Ken Calais. Ken, how are you? Good, Warren. Nice to see you again. It's lovely to be here. So this is actually your new studio. It's my new studio. It's going to be uh, uh, Atmos Studio, and we're going to do uh, vocal overdubs, new artist uh, uh, discovery, and uh, artist development. Wonderful. So I'm excited to be out here. I'm excited to, yeah, it's my new... Our, we got kicked out of our last studio. That was a, kind of a slum over anyhow, but... <laughs> Dang, did I say that? <laughs> you don't have to cut that. <laughs> um, I've got a million questions to ask you, but I think I would like to know a, bit, a little bit about your journey before we get to the obvious questions. Where were you, where were you born? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Northern California in San Jose, and uh, I uh, fell in love with music. I was actually a going to be a lawyer. I was a, a law major in college. I went to college. Somewhere along the line, pot swept San Jose. <laughs> and I decided uh, I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. I got a job as a, at a law office as an intern to learn how it was, and I just hated it. So I decided to go into music. I started playing guitar, learned to play guitar. I started writing songs and uh, started recording my own songs on a little Sony personal home, a tape recorder at home. And Wonderful. I got good at that. I started recording bands, and uh, I decided I'm going to move to L.A. and get a job. My girlfriend moved to L.A., so I followed her, and I said, I'm going to get a job at Wally Hyder's. Oh, fantastic. Turns out the biggest one. So every, everyone told me that, well, I knew that. I, I tried to get a job at, at uh, Capitol Records, at, uh, at RCA Records, all the, the big studios. Everyone said, you're wasting your time. Go to Wally Hyder's. Wally Hyder's does remote recording. And I so see. they go on the road. They only re So if you think about it, the only bands who do live recording are big ones. So you, cut, you, know, you separate the wheat from the chaff and you start to, to go after, after these amazing bands. So I worked for Pink Floyd. I worked with Paul McCartney. I worked with uh, George Harrison. Um, and just all kinds of uh, country folk music, and it was great. Uh, recording live is a real baptism of fire, though, isn't it? You don't, you don't, there's no do-overs. Well, yeah, that's right. It's, it's recording recording is a, is a trial, but you got to get it right. So Wally Hyder's was, was the best. Wally Hyder himself was a, was a jazz aficionado, and he built a recording truck to, so he could record all these big bands. Woody Herman and and all the, the the big bands of the time, he put out a lot of records. So, and he seemed to be always there when you fucked up. <laughs> when I fucked up, so he was a great mentor for all the people that were around me that we all worked with Hyder. And so, and we had the best equipment, so we learned very quickly how to. Like my first tour was Creedence Clearwater Europe. What year I, was this? Uh, Seventy one. Oh, it's just they were huge. Yeah, and so I, that's what I did. I went, I went to to Europe and went all to all the countries that they toured and recorded Creedence Clearwater. What an incredible experience! I thought this is this is this is great. <laughs> then I got back to uh, L.A. and I started uh, being a second engineer, and I worked behind all of uh, all the greats. Then, I, and I stole as many ideas as I could. I had a journal. I took notes of what mics, what, why they use that patch cord, why they use that limiter, uh, why they use a compressor. They had bass roll off on on filters. I wrote it all down. That's incredible. Don't happen to still have that notebook, do you? Pardon me. Do you still happen to have that notebook? No, I ate it. I <laughs> dissolved it. I think seventy one. I I was dying to get into the studio and 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 have some noise come through the speakers so in the early morning i was stocking the studios with with tape and and all the other supplies that i had to go in there so i looked around and i decided to take the oscillator and i patched the oscillator into channel one of the console and i busted up figured out how to bust it to the one of the speakers turn up the monitors and 1k and i heard 1k through the speakers and cool then i went then i went down to 400 cycles or whatever, put that through the speakers. Cool. Then I decided to go for the high frequencies. I remember 10K, 15K. 15K, I don't really hear it. 
turn all turn it up all the way. And I got a call a half hour later. The tweeters are blown in the studio. <laughs> they weren't blown last night. <laughs> anyway. Oops. Oops. <laughs> so. Um, so the. Uh, so that was... got me into the to the recording business, and then uh, I got really good, and I started. Wally started. I was. I loved the EQ, and I learned how to use the EQ. And Wally would send me these odd bands. I remember polkas. I got a lot of polka bands, <laughs> and you know these harmonicas and and the the, the polka music with the mandolin and I. And I EQ'd the shit out of everything. I mean, the the snare was just right in your face, and the hard left and right polka music and and music just playing, and and everybody loved it. I'm not sure that the polka people loved it, but they're kind of going, sounds hip, sounds like rock and roll. No, so I, yeah, I, I so I started mixing everything, and I got really good at at mixing rock, and I started. They started sending me rock bands, and so I. So one day, uh, Fleetwood Mac uh, had just finished their White album, and uh, had done. They they uh, booked a uh, remote with Wally Hyder to do King Biscuit Flower Hour, where they they had they had their music on t- tour. I didn't go d- do. I didn't know the recording was happening, but I got a call later that week that they wanted. To, the, the show had to be mixed down, and they wanted me to mix it. So, on a Saturday afternoon, I walked into the studio, and and Fleetwood Mac walked into the room, and and I said, I walked up to Stevie, and I, on the album cover, the, the names were kind of confusing, who was who, and I walked up to Stevie, and I said, Lindsay, big fan, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> she listened to me, go, yeah, I'm Stevie. <laughs> but we had a great day. We, so so my first day working with them was mixing this live album, and I was completely relaxed. I had I didn't sense any sense of danger or anything by doing the show. And uh, the next day they said, "Well, we're now now we have to mix this uh, single version of Rhiannon," and but they said, "Unfortunately, we already booked." Uh, the record plant to mix uh, at 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 their studios with uh, an engineer there. So, but we had a great day. They they were like hugging us. They said, "Such a great day. Wish you were coming with us." So, off they went, and I and they uh, I got a call. That was Sunday. I got, a, I got a call Monday morning that the recording had gone horribly wrong. The guy, the engineer, choked. Uh, 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 and he probably had every the whole band breathing down his neck. Like I was so relaxed, I wasn't nothing worried, and I just and I, I saw no danger. But they were they're like, well, Ken didn't do that. What are you doing? What are you doing? So <laughs> he completely choked, and so they called me up. They said, they said, okay, Monday, can you come mix the 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 single version of Rhiannon, which I did, and and uh, I think. What set it apart is because I liked using a lot of EQ on the API consoles. So I, I, I made the whole track, which was a Keith Olson track. Keith Olson likes to make pillowy. Back then, anyway, he, had, he took a lot of 800 cycles out on the mix or 400 cycles. It was just boop, boop. And it was almost folky. And I just went the other way, I plus 12, plus 15, and adding just really a lot of bite in and it, you know, it was perfect for a single mix. So uh, they all loved it, and they uh, they said, you know, we're going to go n- next week. We're going to go up to Sausalito and record the a new album. And uh, we don't have an engineer. Would you like to be our, our engineer? And uh, they already had Richard Dash, who was their their family engineer, and he was their live road guy. So Rich and I were asked to, to go up to Sauce Leader to record Rumors, as it turned out. Incredible. Yeah. So it's interesting because you just bought the record plant in Sausalito. I did. The studio that you made Rumors in, with yep. the vast majority of Rumors. Yep. It was sitting there by itself, and I was worried that it was I was going to get a call from someone saying that it just had burnt down. Uh, it was abandoned. It, it was locked up. 
and they were just through hard times. So I finally said, you know, I, I think I have the credits to do something. And I started reaching around to my friends and saying, let's, let's, let's put an investment group together and buy this sucker. And we did. We closed it three days before COVID struck. Oh. So my investors were, great, we got it. Now let's go raise money to, to renovate it. And there was COVID. Where's, where's it at at the moment uh, in, in the process? Have you started the renovation? I'd say it's 80% done. Oh, wow. Uh, they had a huge, this whole winter was a, a really brutal rainstorm mm. in Northern California. So we had to, they had to put in a, a French drain, they called it, because the hillside comes down and the water just comes up, pulls against the building. And I guess a French drain is a, a buried drain where the water goes to birds. I know the studio incredibly well. Uh, I, I have the dubious honor of being recording the band that was the last band recorded there before it closed down. Who's that? The Fray. We did three months there. Oh, great. And after we finished the record, they closed it down. Yeah. I just ran into Bill Snay the other day, and he turned out to be at the record plant at the same time I was in January 76, recording Pablo Cruz. So I was working so much, and I guess he was too, that we never never ran into him. So he was, you, you were in the room on the back, on the I suppose on the left, and he would have been in the other one. Right. And you never saw each other. Never. I know the studio so well, and it's incredible that you've never crossed paths. But I understand once you're once you're marooned in a control room, right? And when I got out, the only person I went to go see was the the hot receptionist. <laughs> the uh, did you ever use that hot tub out there? The infamous hot tub? I didn't. I think as an engineer and a producer, you you, you can speak to this. We don't get many breaks. It's uh, no, and and they Gary Calgren, who's one of the builders of the record plant, built those hot tubs. And they and he put in portals, portholes, between the hot tubs and Studio A. And so theoretically, you could sit in the hot tub and soak and have the porthole open and listen to the to the production. So very luxurious if you're in that if you're a musician and yeah. you want you want to get involved. I never. I don't know. None of the band went in. I didn't go in because it always had this foam. This 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 film over top of the... I can imagine. Yeah. It d didn't look like it had been cleaned recently, I can imagine. And I'm sure it was, but anyway, they... When I was in there in, in, in the same room, we tracked in the same room as you, um, I was told that there was this uh, sly kind of big pair of lips, and there was like a, a, a little hideaway in there where Sly Stone would sit and write, um, I presume, where they went, obviously when doing Fresh. Um, and they said that's where Stevie sat and, and wrote. Is that is that true? Do you have a right. memory of that? She wrote, she wrote her uh, dreams in, the, in Sly's bedroom. In Sly's bedroom. But that has been buried. Uh, they dug it out. It, apparently, it was an upside down ice cream cone. Oh. And it was it was. I think they covered it up in 1980. So it was in the back area. Right. And then I heard another story that there used to be a pit. Same one. So it's the same one. Oh, so it was a pit right. because they had this idea of like having the musicians perform around the top of the pit right. and Sly was in the bottom of the right. pit. Right, so it was like up, really an upside down kick. It right. kind of went boom, 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 and you could sit along at the edges. And at the bottom there was a, key, a, a keyboard and there was a small console. Oh, wow. And so that's where she wrote Dreams. Yeah. So one of the things I've read that you've talked about quite frequently is that you've initially struggled to get tones out of the studio and really weren't enjoying it. And I think I had one quote where you said you were actually afraid you were going to get fired. I knew I was going to get fired. <laughs> I was really an un, un, try, untried and true engineer. Nobody knew. I hadn't done anything. They just had a good feeling about me. Um, but I was nothing like Keith Olsen. I didn't have that kind of talent. I was just an engineer, hired as an engineer. I set up all the mics to, to, to do, to start with mixed drums. I had my favorite mics that always worked. I did, I used them live. I used them, the other, another set for the studio. I set everything up and, but the, but the studio A was so dead. It was so dead in the room. I remember the mixed snare was loud out there, but it would just go bonk and the sound would disappear. And so we, 
in desperation, we got we ordered sheets of plywood. Mick, uh, Mick's drums were set on a piece of plywood. Uh, plywood was behind his drums, reflecting out, and and it was still by the time. By the time I figured out what was going on, that I made the room much more live, uh, we took a, opened the curtains when we could. That uh, I was mainly focusing on EQ, trying to make the open up the mic breeze and make them uh, sound fuller. And I remember th- pulling the EQ, opening up the preamp as far as I could, and bringing the fader down as low as I could because I had heard that that I could hear that that's makes a, a more open sound. But by that time, I was only listening to the snare. And it was just bonk, bonk, and I, and I, and I, I lost track of the big picture. And so we did this for four or five days. We, Rich and I even put a, two kick drums together and made a, uh, I don't know. Like a resonating kick drum on the front right. of the other kick drum? And it nothing worked. Nothing worked. And Mick was Mick was a prince. He just sat there, whatever you want to try, boys, because he had, I guess, recommended that Richard and I go up and do the record. And so finally, I said, "Okay, fuck this. <laughs> Everybody, go to your go to your everything was mic. Go to your uh, instruments, and we're just going to uh, do it. And just count it out. Let's just do it. And I'll get the EQ, and we'll get the settings as we go. And literally, I." <laughs> You know, they started playing, and I started just twisting knobs, just eat, boom, 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 opening up, getting the bounces, checking the meters. And within three minutes of them doing it, it sounded like a record. And suddenly you had the bass and everything playing, and it was it was just amazing. And Rich and I looked at each other, and we looked at the, the band, and they were going, they go, Kelly, what the fuck took so long? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, we were, we were myopic. We were focusing on the little thing, but I just remember it just happened that quickly, just with those EQs, and that board was so great. So we made this, and that was the first song. It was called Keep Me There. It was Christine's song. It actually wasn't a very good song, uh, but in the... The song that became Chang, the Chang. Came, yes. Yeah, but in the, but as Keep Me There went worked out, there was a two choruses, and then there was a tag, that, and then there was a part in, right in the middle of the tag, where John plays this famous bass line, boom, ba ba boom, ba 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 boom, boom. And then Lindsay started playing a solo. And it went on for two or three minutes. And and it was such an amazing performance that we we had this thing, this turkey called Keep Me There, that had this tremendous ending. And we kept as as the months went on, we kept taking going to other songs and working on it. And every t- once in a while, we try to bring the keep me there back up to see what we could, could we figure something out? We never could. So we were going to re- record it, replace it with something else. But it's like, geez, the solo, that whole end piece is so good. So that's that's from the original recording of Keep Me There. So did you, you, you must have edited that on tape, presumably, yes? Well, we figured it out. The uh, <clears throat> So we were mixing. We were down to mixing. We were at the producer's workshop, and they have this really great console and transformerless, and it was sounding so good. And Lindsay comes in one day. He says, "I figured out how to, what to do with Keep Me There," and it's like, "What?" He says, "Okay, I want you to put in blank tape in all the verses, intro verse, blank tape, and leave the choruses." So I, I had to cut out the, the verse and put in blank tape for both verses. And then, and so then he says, okay, I wanna, I'm want i gonna do a kick kick drum. And we set up for Mick to do a kick drum and and we started and we played to a click and there was, and Lindsay set up to play a dobro. And so that was ding to ding to ding, boom, boom. And the kick drum was enormous to this console. It was sounded so great. And so suddenly it's like this whole song had, was reborn again, it was amazing. And I remember the, uh, to me, a funny tale is that the the tech at the producer's workshop was kind of a, a nerdy guy, and he reaches, comes over and whispers in my ear, and he says, "By the way, your kick drum mic is capsules collapsing." And I looked at him like, "Jesus!" I said, "Yeah, it sounds fucking great, doesn't it?" <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, that was, so that was it. So that we had to 
the new verses, Jane to D and, and the vocals, and then the choruses, we had to do a new melody line and a new bass line, new drums. Well, we didn't do new drums. Keep Me There was the first song we recorded, and it was the last song we recorded, and it was also the only song that all the band members have writer's contributions. So they all write, wrote the, the chorus lyrics and the end lyrics for, you know, chain, keep us together. So they did all that, but it was like, it was just such a magical thing. It was like, it just happened. And uh, I mean, I think a lot of the way the record happened was almost too good to be true. So like, if you want to know an example, Please. So at the very beginning when we were recording those basic tracks, the studio manager who was hot, <laughs> this might have had something to do with my decision. She said, you know, Ken, we're giving you the tape at our, our cost, and we have 224 tracks in the control room. If you want, go ahead and record uh, the, the basic tracks with double 24. So I said, sure, honey. And I did. I recorded all the, the basic tracks on all, for all 12 songs, double 24. So I had a second reel of, of the... Incredible. Of, the, of the, the basic track, kick, bass, and all that stuff, drums. And, and five months into it, uh, I started listening to... We were had left there. We had moved down to Wally Hyder recording in, in L.A. And we were doing overdubs, and I started saying, I said... Does anybody else here that think it's getting dull in the the, uh, the mixes? And I'm starting to add more EQ to our playbacks. And I and I told the second engineer to check the, the tape heads and see if there's anything weird there. And we looked at the tape heads, and they were just filled with oxide, this black oxide. So we realized we had an emergency. Our our tape was wearing out. It was just shedding. It was letting go completely. So my second engineer said, you know, maybe this is a time when we can use those, those double 24, or those duplicate basic tracks. We can overdub all the new overdubs onto the old drums. So I said, yeah, let's do, let's do that. And, uh, but how do you sync them? Exactly, because we had no time code, no ability to sync it. So what are we going to do? We're just going to punt. You know, we're going to... We're going to manually sync them, which is impossible. But it wasn't. When we went to ABC Dunhill, we decided to try to sync the two tape machines together, which wasn't that hard. I mean, it, they, we, had, we were using two 3M79s. They have a little BSO right on, the, right on the control panel. So we would mark the two tapes where they were exactly identical, and then I would start them at the same time. And then we would see where we were. And we would adjust one machine or the other until we got it, so it worked. So it was like we were close. So then we started fine tuning. And once we got it, so we were really close, we put the, uh, the hi-hat in one, one, in one ear of the headphone and the other hi-hat from the other machine in the other headset. And so if you started it together, they were right together in mono. But as, as they started to drift, if it go, started drifting this way, we would turn, we arranged it so we were able to turn the VSO and steer it back to this. So literally, we were steering this this hi hat between your between your two ears. Incredible. I tr I tried doing it for half a song, and Bob said, "Get get out of here, you amateur." And he <laughs> and he did the whole thing the whole night. We did the we did all twelve songs, I think, in. 16 hours, something like that. And he was like, he saved it. Absolutely amazing. He saved rumors, so. Yeah, the drums, set, the drums have got bite and bright. I can't imagine what it would be if they were dull and lifeless. I know. And I've never in my life run double 24 track again, ever. I mean, except for live shows. But so the fact that I did that, it's like, she was either really good looking <laughs> or, or, I mean, we were really lucky in doing that. Yep, that's an incredible. Uh, I, I don't know. Anyway, so. Um, so it was basically a year-long project. Starting in Sausalito, you were there for, what, five months? 
Five months, yeah. We started in January 27th of 1976. And we went to January 10th or something of 77. So from Sausalito to Wally's for overdubs and then to the producer's workshop for mixing. And did you master it there as well? I know they had a mastering room there. Uh, this, actually, we went to we went to Record Plant. Then we went to Wally Hyder's for the whole summer. We did overdubs. Then uh, as they had, they had another tour coming up, we decided to go follow them on tour where they played uh, Miami. They did a show in Miami. So we went to record. We did the Lee Guitars at Criteria in Miami. Well, fantastic. And then we did a little bit of record plant in L.A. and a little bit of Sound City, a little bit of Davlin, which they had a Bosendorf for piano, which we wanted to use a Bosendorf for. Do you remember who mastered it? Where it was mastered? Was it down at Brooklyn? I do. We mastered Capitol Records, a guy named Ken Perry. Fantastic. He was great. When we finished Rumors, uh, and one of the guys over at Warner's uh, told me that we could get some fresh vinyl, uh, better vinyl than they, they used in Standard. And uh, But when we were mastering, Ken Perry would cut the cut, cut the album on, on, cut new vinyl on his lathe, and then he would set this, and we were so precious because we realized a stereo record could be a, could be completely ruined by the wrong EQ. One guy could wipe out everything. So as Ken Perry was making these pressings for test pressing purposes, he would drop them in a box on the floor. And I go, What's, what are you doing there? He said, well, they, they have to go out to the plant. At the end of the day, they'll go to the plant. They'll be dipped in. And you know, their materials will be treated, and they'll be make it into a record. You'll get you'll get a copy of the of, of the test pressing, and that's you'll know what's going on. But I said, I kept looking at the the thing, you know, flies flying around. I'm, I'm, so those are just sitting there. I said, yeah, I said is, I said is, and we lose nothing. From the time you cut it to the time they they get there overnight when they go to the plant, he goes, "Well, you know, you might lose a little bit." Oh, okay. Now, go back. What do you mean lose a little bit? <laughs> well, it's called spring back. He says, "You know, so there's this the, the the grooves that we cut in the vinyl, they'll be cut and they'll start to spring back to whatever they were at." And I'm going insane. Don't tell me that. <laughs> so. So this is this is what Ken Perry was telling me, and I'm going. I said, "Well, can we get it into a bath sooner?" That's what they they put it into an acid bath or something. And he goes, "Well, I mean, the only one that we use is this place up in Fremont or someplace. Uh, I think it was maybe Camarillo." He says, "There is a little place, a little little custom shop down on Santa Monica Boulevard." So. So you went straight there. Said, tell me there. Tell me, yeah. And I called up Warner's, the guy at Warner's, head at Warner's. Um, and we turned out, we found out, we could, Richard and I shuttled, we would drive a pick, the disc popped off the, the turntable. We'd take it in a box. We would drive down to uh, Precision Lacquer or something like that, down to Santa Monica Boulevard, and watch them drop this thing in there. It's like, Six minutes. Bam. Nice. Fuck you, spring back, you know. <laughs> and then, so Ed at Warner said, you know, we can also have this special vinyl, really virgin vinyl. If you wanted, we could do, you know. I said, if I wanted. <laughs> you know, you're asking the wrong person. Of course I wanted. Because at that time, Warner's were doing backflips over the, the, the white album that I had mixed Rhiannon on was still climbing the charts. Uh, and as of in eight months later, it was still kind of ramping down. And uh, so Warners was just saying, whatever these guys want. So pretty, I was pretty lucky to be sitting in a situation like that. So tell me a little bit about the Strato Blaster that you used on the roads. Because I was going back and listening to You Make Loving Fun the other day. And that's... You know, as soft and beautiful as Christine's voice is, that's quite an aggressive, you know, electric piano sound. 
So what was, you know, I read a little bit in your book about it, about how you, you, you drove the amp pretty hard, about like an extra 10 or 15 dB. Seems like quite aggressive. It was amazing. Yeah. So I had, I had, somebody had this thing, the Fender made a Stratoblaster or somebody made it for Fender that would sit in, uh, where, in the tailpiece where you where you plug in your car, guitar cord. And so it was, basic little thing with a nine volt battery and then it had a switch on or off. So, and it was quite an aggressive uh, effect when you're adding 10 dB or one dB, whatever it was at the, at, at the, at the source, it really made a difference. So I, I had that made into, into a metal box that I carried with me. So if I was using like Lindsay's guitar, or we were plugged into a high watt in you know, Marshall stack. I would put the switch in and stand back and it would just rip your head off. <laughs> and Lindsay would go. He loved it. So so I got this. I, I'm having him built one built right now. Wonderful. I, I had it here, but it's the electrician took it. But you put it on you put it on Christine's piano. I put it on anything. I mean, we would try it on anything. If it improved it, it seemed to open up the, the frequencies and you could hear them more clarity. Goldust Woman, do you have any memories on that Dobro sound? Because I still think, I don't think, I believe that's one of the best guitar sounds ever recorded. Do you have any memories of the recording on that you can share? Well, I mean, I always used a, I always like to be as close to direct as possible, plus an amp and be able to get that stereo sound. Um, one of my tricks on acoustic guitars uh, was I would put an ECM-50, mount it on the guitar inside the, the guitar hole. This is the Sony little... Yeah. And that, you know, that really gave me this hyper-aggressive sound. I, I was going for edge. So I'm pretty sure that's what we used on, on the Dobro. And then there's some sound effects on there, like breaking glass and stuff like that. How, how did you do those? Well, Mick did it. Oh, he did? Yeah. So Mick, well, we, at the very end of the record, we were, we were finishing up at, I think it was Record Planner, and we uh, decided we wanted breaking glass. So the roadies brought in these sheets of glass, and Mick, Mick put on overalls and helmet and goggles and gloves and so he was up on a big tall ladder and he was listening on headphones you know ding to ding to ding <laughs> so, but, but it, the glass was heavy and wouldn't break on cue so we finally realized okay the only way to do this he's gonna be he's gonna be five seconds later a quarter of a second late we went ahead and just broke a bunch of glass and then recorded it and placed it where we wanted it to be how were you flying it about in those days? Uh, Did you do it on a separate two track? And right, then, right. And just kind of sat there and triggered it and played it where right. you wanted it to be. Get it right, you know. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the Zeller Auditorium recording. Now, I'd read that you'd had uh, a great experience recording Joni Mitchell that way. Right. And you wanted to take the same approach with Songbird because you felt it was such a beautiful song that Christine had written, what, very late on. She read, yeah, late, late on, and uh, but it was late in the studio that night when she was when she was writing it. And so she was, I was standing. I remember standing in the in the corner wrapping up mic cables, and she starts playing the song, and I like, oh my god, that's so beautiful! I dashed into the control room, and of course all the micro, all the instruments were mic'd up already, so I hit record on the two track and uh, recorded this. This what the the last piece of the the of songbird. The next morning we came back in and I said, "You guys got to listen to this." And I played the 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 songbird, and but then it didn't seem right. I wasn't it wasn't dark at night. I wasn't tired, and so I was started adding EQ. Uh, I started adding a reverb, especially to try to make it feel more. I don't know, a, a, a attainable listening. It. So, and I said, this isn't working. And I just blurted out, I said, we need to go to Zellerback Auditorium and record this thing live. And I said, they have a nine foot concert grand there, and they have a, a crystal shell, and we'll, we'll 
we'll have it go out to the hall and it'll be sounding beautiful. And they went, <laughs> they said, okay, go ahead and make that. <laughs> what, no argument or nothing? <laughs> so they just said, okay. So I called up, I think Hyder is, and I called the Hyder truck and said, send your big mobile up. And I felt like, you know, things had come my way. <laughs> yeah, bring the truck up here. Bring all the mi- great mics, I said. The tube mics, every tube mic you can get. I'm going to tube mic the whole hall and uh, with this b- piano. I'm going to put the, uh, I'm going to order the kestrel shell, kestrel shell to project the piano sound out into the hall. So Berk- I'm, I think it was Berkeley Community Theater. I decided to see if we could record there, but it wasn't available. So, and Joan, that's where Joni had recorded. So they said there's a place called Zellerback Auditorium, which we said, great, well, let's do it there. Everything set up, the crystal, crystal shell, the piano was tuned, moved in. I had them put three follow spots down on the piano. I got uh, th- three dozen roses, put it on there, laid them on the piano. Beautiful. Spots, and she <laughs> she came in and she started crying. Oh. I mean, it was she was just so amped up. It was great, you know. So one of my better days. <laughs> I, I probably got a lot of worse days. But anyway, so we started recording. So soon after we started recording, I realized the piano wasn't amped. Um, nobody, there, wasn't P, there was no PA, and the piano just wasn't doing much for the hall. All these microphones were just, they were quiet, you know, hissing of electricity. And uh, I, now I didn't think about this. Now what am I going to do? Turns out Zellerback had a PA system. So they we hooked up the PA system to the microphone, and amazing, the piano then sounded amazing. So I had her run down the piano, and she said, I'm going to need a click. And I said, okay, great. And I said, can you sing and do that? She, I can't do I can't sing and play at the same time, not with a click. So suddenly I realized that I had to give her a click. So, so this is problem solving 101 or 202. <laughs> so we tried to give her a click in her headphones, but, but, it was a, it was annoying to her, and I think we got we could hear the leakage of the click in the cans. So I said, we said the crew said somebody said, why don't we? What if we give it to Lindsay, the click to Lindsay, and we'll put Lindsay behind the shell, and he'll be on, and the shell will be here, and the pan will be here, and Lindsay will be behind the shell, and so Lindsay put on his headphones and played acoustic guitar. So he was um, ching, ching, just playing the rhythm, and Christine would play piano along with him. Again, we realized that she couldn't sing and play too because the leakage of her vocal would get into the piano. So it's like, okay, rethink all that. So we just had her play the piano until she got a good one. And then we realized after that, hey, we can just play that out to the PA system. <laughs> like, like, duh. So then we then we played it back into the PA system and, and tweaked all the mics to have the the audience mics just sound amazing. And then she was when she's ready, she went out on on microphone. We had a great two forty seven, the best one we could find, and she just sang. Was her vocal going through the PA as well? Yeah, incredible. So you got all of those room mics again picking up right. her vocal. Now. This is wonderful because I also read you were talking about um, recording acoustic guitar with Lindsay. You had a ton of bleed issues. So you 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 put a beanie on his head and what other things did you do to try and kill the click and bleed it? Well, I know that ultimately, you know, he had that big afro. Right. And so he had, the, I think they were Koss headphones. They were the biggest, they were the ones that isolated the most. And we we took gaffer tape and literally gaffer taped. We put, I think we put the beanie around his head so his hair wouldn't get stuck, stuck in the gaffers. And then we taped it around his head. He couldn't get it off and it was just tight. <laughs> so we finally minimized the leakage. And it was so much fun, you know, I mean, being a part of that, just making that happen and thinking. Do whatever of, you had to do to. Yeah, thinking on your feet. But I remember that, you know, it, such a, we got such a good emotion. Like Mick, and she plays that show uh, every night of her show. She played, that was the long, last song. And Mick and John would always say that they would, 
they they went they weren't playing. Of course, they were sitting off stage, and they would sit and cry when they listened to her oh, playing. It's beautiful. So, and I was really and now that she's died. I mean, I'm I'm really glad I have that memory with her. So, and when she was, I have to tell you that. So when she was when I was coiling up the cables, and she was playing, I stopped doing what I was doing, and I was like, holy crap. And I and I walked over to her, and I sat down on her piano bench right next to her. <laughs> While she was playing. Yeah. And she kind of looked at me like, what the fuck are you doing? You know? You're the fucking engineer. You don't sit on the piano bench with me. It just wasn't really the right thing to do, but... But you, you felt compelled. But she, and she knew. She said, okay. Now, a, a lot has been made, obviously, of the fact that... that, that there was these two couples in this band, both simultaneously going through breakups of their marriage or their relationships, but they all kind of got together for a year of their life and put all of that aside, right. but also channeled a lot of lyrical, a lot of uh, catharsis was going on. Right. Um, a lot of healing. A lot of healing. A lot of blaming. <laughs> a lot of blaming, right. But it's interesting how there's a sort of juxtaposition where some of the music is so almost like happy, you know, but the lyric can be quite dark. So there was a sort of, there's, there's, there's love, there's like light and shade going on at the same time, I think, almost. It is. How much of that feeling came into play? How much, how much did you feel it yourself and you were sort of navigating that? Or was it just your job to just do your job and... Well, my job, I, at first, I, my job was like, okay, you two are screaming at each other. Mm -hmm. Why don't, would you guys like to go outside or go somewhere else and talk? And would you guys like to record? That you guys, and I took whoever was in a good, good spirit and basically recorded until, so until, until Stevie got a call from her accountant that, and her lawyer, I think he's, and he said, you know, you're, the White Album is climbing the charts like crazy. And, it, and like I said, it, it took almost eight months before the White Al Album hit the top of, uh, of the peak. So he said, you know, Stevie, if you guys can keep it together and uh, keep making this record, if you can make this record as good as the last record, that's all you have to do. Just make it that good. You'll never have to work again. And, and Stevie's thing, she used to walk around saying, I don't want to be a cleaning lady anymore. Because that's what she did. And there are many recordings you hear her, I don't want to be a cleaning lady. And so she came into the, to the room this one day, and, and she said, I just got off the phone with my people, and they said, if we can do this, make this record just as good as the last one, uh, which they were so fired up, ready to do a record, they, they would have, it would have been easier, and it was. But he said, if you can do it, you'll never have to work again. And she said, okay, this is what he told me. Why don't we all put all the bullshit aside? We all know we're breaking up. Let's make a record anyhow. And I thought, this is like an American thing, you know? I hear this often. And it really, I mean, it touches me even just to talk about it. It was so amazing for her to say, and they went, they went, yeah, okay, you got it. I said, let's make this record. And they did, you know, and, and I didn't think about it much more. But later on, and realizing that the lyrics were very painful for them, they had to hear this over and over. I mean, we listened over and over and over. And even the vocals, but then punching in on you make loving fun and ooh, it's just. Never going back again. Yeah. Don't stop. Yeah. So. Anyway, that's why I wrote the book, because I thought somebody needs to know about this. Because it was pretty special. Absolutely beautiful. When did you get the space? When did I get that? Yeah, this space. Uh, February 1st. Lovely. It's exciting. I mean, you've worked on all these incredible albums, and now people are coming back saying, hey, let's do stuff in Atmos. Yep. Joni, um, I'm a huge Joni Mitchell fan, and... Uh, uh, obviously, we've been blessed to share some of it with the stuff that you and Mark did. Do um, you find it's uh, a challenge going back and reimagining it, or is it the opposite? Is it kind it's of a opposite. blessing? 
just the opposite. I mean, it's, it's, I listened to Joni and the record company is very insistent upon you, uh, you fought matching kind of the stereo. So having been as Fleetwood as long as I was, I know we had the, we had, we had the stereo constraints, we had mono constraints. And I know that if I was working with Fleetwood now and we had seven speakers, they would be all like, put the sound everywhere, wherever you want. And so I go in with Joni and I'm listening and I think, well, they did this. They kind of glued the, some of the instruments together with reverb or delays or things that I said, but this is way better. So I, I told them, I, I, have to, I have to present this to you. If you want us to stick to the stereo, you, I think you're wrong. But Joni said she loved it. So That's incredible. Yeah, that's quite different from what's being portrayed by people that weren't involved in the records. They're, they're always insisting that this was never meant to be this way. But when I asked like, you and, and Jack Douglas and Shelly Ackes and all, all, all the, you guys have made some of the best records of all time, you always respond with... If we'd had that, if we'd had that at the time, we would have embraced it and been right. using it. As, and, and not all music works, you know. Not, not all productions worked, but a lot of them do. The, and Joni's were just amazing. That's incredible. So, and what, Fleetwood's, we did some great Fleetwood stuff. What uh, what Joni stuff are you uh, currently working on? I worked with uh, a Court and Spark. Beautiful record. And we worked with Miles of Isle. It's a live album, which is a double album. And we worked with Hissing of Summer Lawns. Incredible. And just all these things that come out of her head. Are you going through the catalog? Oh, yeah, I'm not. I mean, you know, uh, Warner's has their own their own plans. They're trying to match it with, they're, they're doing like a, a custom release of a bunch of songs, so... That one of the things I think is is screwy about Atmos is that there's labels aren't releasing anything; they've got nothing to release. So and the, and who's releasing it? Uh, you know, a- Apple is re- releasing. They're not selling it; they're releasing it for free as streaming. So where Universal only knows about well, what about? So they're releasing some of Joni's on on Blu-ray. So now they're asking people to go back to Blu-ray, dust off your old Blu-ray player, and which is kind of screwy. But I don't know. So and and there's hardware people aren't man, aren't supporting it with a home system. Joni said, "I'd love to hear this at home. How do I do it?" Just, I mean, it's there's not really a home Atmos system that's reliable. So. I think that somebody should make uh, public Atmos listening spaces. That might be his. Maybe you can smoke a joint at, or have your cocktail <laughs> at, or have a cigar. You know, nice lounge chairs. And I think I think it's it's all it's all slowly getting there. Um, I suppose I suppose what's great about Atmos is or immersive uh, is um, all if you mix in it, you can be folded down to every format. So for the kid that's listening, you know playing games and has music that's done like that from from that kid all the way up to obviously being in a movie theater being surround and everything in in between i think is is quite amazing a lot of opportunities yeah it's kind of amazing how what how dolby survived this whole thing they were just a noise reduction company you know we had dolby on our tape on our rumors tapes to hold the tape noise down what would it have been in those days a or dolby a tba yeah yeah Last one, one Is that right, I, Mark? Yes. Last one I remember using was S and SR. Uh, we use SR. Yep. So if you took the Dolby off, which I've heard, it just sounds like everything had 15 dB of top end. Yeah. Decoded. Not- a, a were the big, big, heavy duty boxes. Yeah, they would do. There's a, the vocal trick, isn't it, where you take, uh, you 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 record it with it on and then you play it back with it off and it's just got this massive high-end boost. Makes the vocals super, super bright. And I remember I was mixing a live show that we did for Fleetwood at the Budokan and I stayed behind while, while Fleetwood went back to Hawaii and, 
and uh, I was recording the, and I and I had him take the hi hat, uh, the the dobe off the hi hat, and the, and the guys, Japanese guys, go, oh, no, I can't do it. No dobe, you gotta take it off. Yeah, take it off. I had to go, finally go switch switch it off myself, and they're going, no, you don't understand, you don't do that. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> but it was funny that people didn't understand it then. Amazing. Yeah. Anyway, it was funny to me. So Silver Springs was recorded for rumors, but didn't make it. Right. Do you have any memories of of of, of the recording of it, and also the choice? Oh yeah, was- I mean the Silver Springs was, I think, one of our finest recordings. I remember I had I had put a, a ECM fifty on Lindsay's uh, uh, Fender Strat, Fender Strat, right, solid body. But he was sitting next to me playing this, and he had a volume pedal. So he would, you know, pluck the strings, and I and I hear this cling, cling off his fingernails on the on the strat strings. And it sounded so good. And and all that was coming back out of the speakers is just well, I'm just part of a muted guitar sound. So I said, I want to try something. Let's put you out in the studio. And put and put you uh, put an ECM fifty on your guitar, and then we ran the the volume pedal through a Leslie, and the Leslie was in an echo chamber sitting there, just and the Leslie was just spinning slowly. So you hear wow wow wow, and he looked at me like holy crap, that sounds good, and the idea changed of what he was playing, and and everything just lined up. Then we acoustic guitars, and and I, and I was one of our really one of our best recordings. And I was so proud of being a part of it and how everybody jumped on board that uh, I was sad that it, it couldn't go on. But And I had the, the unpleasant task of explaining to Stevie how, why it couldn't go on. Why didn't it go on? It just wasn't any time. In my book, I talk about, if you look at the, the when we were setting up the running order on the whole album, you know, the running order back then was so important because you put the needle down, you have to listen to the whole side, you don't hear just one song. But it's the, the it was one very long, slow song. I think it was originally 11 minutes long. And I had to cut it down to six minutes or four minutes, whatever the final thing was. And she was like, cry. That's my, that's my grandmother I'm talking about. Hmm. I said, well, I said, there's one other thing we could do. We could not cut it and take one of your other songs off the record. She was, fuck my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, so I remember that reversal of, wait, wait a second, that's, now you're talking my language. So we cut it down to, but it still wasn't, we still had too many slow songs. And no matter what we could do, we couldn't, we tried to speed up some stuff and make it feel faster. But the album kind of feel, felt moderately fast and moderately slow anyhow. And uh, anyway, we just couldn't figure out any way to, to, to fit it on. So somebody said, probably Mick or could it, or maybe it was Judy Wong, who's, was our, she was there. You ever heard of Judy Wong? She was great. She lived with Christine and the, all the time from England and uh, but I think she suggested putting it on the B side of the first single, and then then when CDs came out, we knew that we'd have more room, because the 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 reason why, for people who don't know, there's time constraints to records, is a record only holds about 22 minutes of music at full volume. So and back then you wanted the you wanted your song to be full volume, so. When it was playing on the radio against somebody else's song, it didn't sound softer. So, and to fit more on the vinyl, because the, the needle is cutting these grooves that are wiggling, taking real estate up, you would need to, if you turn, pull it down below zero, it, it makes smaller grooves so you could fit more stuff on. But so we knew that the, that we needed, to, we only had 22 minutes to play with. We couldn't go per side. We couldn't go any any lower longer than that, or we'd lose volume. So, so which is why we couldn't. We every way we did the math, there was no way to fit more songs in there. So we either had to put something else, 
save it for later. Incredible. Um, so, so I wrote about it in my book. I said, I said, here's the times. So and here's our problem. Here's all the times. See what you what a running order you can come up with. Nobody ever uh, challenged me on it or said, here's a way to do it. I was interested. So the only person that ever came back was Bob, right? I'm the one that, so you, I write these things. You write these things and you don't know whether they're going to go out and be read by anybody or not. So let's uh, flash forward now. The album's absolutely massive. It's, I mean, ridiculously. At that point, it was... Um, let me remember, I think it was one of the fastest records ever go to a million, and then one of the fastest records ever to go to 10 million worldwide sales. Um, so you're back in. Now it's talk of obviously making a quote-unquote follow-up record to this insanely successful album. And, um, I mean, you, you, with the success of Rihanna, you obviously were able to do pretty much anything you wanted on Rumours, but now Rumours being so huge... You got the opportunity to, the band had an opportunity to have their own studio. So you go, how did the, the sort of relationship with the village start where you so, got to yeah, build the, that room? So after rumors, we had, I remember at the, at the very beginning, I, my accountant called and said, he said, I'm making $10,000 a day on royalties. And I thought, when they told me I was going to be a producer, and I've, I've been, I've been, I've had, percentage of, of albums before, but I made six cents or something, you know. <laughs> you don't get a handed a percentage of a massive record. So I was, I don't have any, I don't get any more lucky breaks ever, you know. That's, I got all my luck right then. But anyway, so when when this record was climbing, uh, uh, Dennis Wilson, Beach Boys, uh, who was dating Christine, uh, he said, I got an idea, Ken. He said, Beach Boys Brothers Studios is going to build a new studio. We will, he said, we'll build you your next studio if you do your next record here. And whatever you want, we'll build it for you. And so we came down and Richard and I came down and looked at it and it was like, great. And we ordered a, a new Neve console for the room and and then we're working on plans and then we, the, our Fleetwood's attorneys got involved and they said, well, hang on. And the Beach Boy attorneys, they got involved, and they said, okay, well, you can't change your mind. Once you do this, if, if you don't like the studio, you still have to record here. I said, well, wait a minute. That's, that's not going to happen. So the Fleetwood attorney said, well, go somewhere else. So I happened to be over at the village, and Jordy Hormel was there. He's the heir of Cornell Hams, and he's kind of an eccentric guy. And we told him we were doing this Beach Boys studio, and it looks like it might be falling to, uh, through the to the wayside. I said, "I'll offer you the same deal. You know, you build us the room, <laughs> we'll do it." And he said, "Okay, that's it. Yeah, no, no, no conditions. Uh, okay." So he just built us the room. We gave them all the spec. We, Richard and I worked with them on a, a bunch of stuff. But we thought it was going to be, we were going to make rumors too. I knew how to do everything. I know how the sound worked. I knew everything we did before, we're going to do it better. We we have little tricks inside the studio so we could get better sounds. We could shoot some video even while we're in there. But it was a, it was a challenge making Tusk. How long did it take? It was a year. A year? Yep. And it ended up being a double album. And that wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be a single album. And, and Mick had a, this idea that he said, why don't we, because he was getting into album design covers. And he said, why, I got this idea. We'll do a single, we'll do two single albums. And we'll, it'll be a double album. And when you buy the second album, it'll slide in sleep and it'll complete the picture. So that'll be, no one's ever done that before. Well, cool, cool. So I figured we're doing Tusk 1 and Tusk 2. But then, as it came out, the, uh, the label decided to do it all, get it all at once, because we'll, take, we'll get the money while we can before they, before they, anybody changes their mind. Cash in while they can. Yeah. <laughs> Jordy was amazing with the, uh, 
with his studios. He, Christine was, so Jordy had long stringy hair and his teeth, he let his teeth go. He was a millionaire. He used to be married to Leslie Caron. You know, remember who she was? She was a British debutante, just lovely little lady. And uh, he was married to her. He was, that's when he wore skinny ties and suits. And then he, let, then he became an eccentric pot smoking millionaire. And uh, so, but, and I remember we went over to his house to talk about the plans, and Christine came along. And she, Christine says, excuse me, Jordy, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> He's paying for everything. He's a millionaire. And she says, "You look at this house. It's just like a hippie den. And you, you ride bicycles around the place. And you let your hair go. And what is the matter with you? And she said, "Just you, I'm embarrassed to be you, with you. Wow. It's just like, Chris, stop it. But anyway, so but he but he was so he wanted to please Chris. I remember. So, so that explained the uh, the the green room that's designed like a British pub, right? The British, the whole British pub thing, all that that yep. dark wood, and and he wanted to. We we laid out the shapes and and what we wanted, and he and what he and he built it with his wood and style. But you know, he was a very elegant room. So, but it's it was a beautiful lounge. Yeah. And those mirrors are insane. Because you feel like you're in a, in a room that's significantly yeah. bigger with this incredible ceiling that you think is looking outside. Right. So it was great. He, and he was, he was a, a, a pleasure to work for. And then Stevie had her own room, which is like a Hawaiian sunset or something. Right. It, it, yeah, it was, we called it the memorial, Stevie Memorial Room. <laughs> right. She had a, her own bathroom, too. Right. Which my hands, every time I went in the bathroom, they still reach in to re- grab my Coke bottle. Out of habit now. <laughs> so you're saying there was a lot of cocaine consumed during the making of that yeah, record? Yeah, you could say that. Yes. Okay. Oh, I did say that. <laughs> you certainly did. And then there's the slate room at the back behind where the drums were, and you would what crack that open and mic it up? Right. But did you actually cut vocals in that room as well? At, well, outside the room. Outside the room. Maybe, okay. maybe inside the room, but yeah. and maybe we played a, car, a guitar in the room. Um, and there was that room straight out to the from the control room on the left side. Yes. That was all mirrored and tiled, and that was where he was on his hands and knees on the floor. That was meant to be to bring a piano in if we wanted to have a be a reverb piano. We opened up the curtains, and we had mirrors on the walls, and so it was. I mean, the room was the building was genius and all kinds of rooms and all kinds of flavors so we wanted to make whatever we wanted to, the sound to sound like we could do it wonderful and was the whole record done there so including mixing or did you go somewhere else to mix we mixed it there mixed it there too I have to think of yes we mixed it there do you remember? Uh, do you remember the master? Ma- where you mastered it? Ken Perry. Oh, great! So you went back to him. Right. Wonderful capital. Right. We even used. Uh, uh, we we got Class A tie lines to run from the village to Capitol Records, and we pat we we rented their uh, one of their uh, echo rooms under. The, they have eight echo chambers under them in the parking lot at Capitol Records. And one, they're all known for world renown. So we re- rented a live chamber from Capitol. It was run with ph- on phone lines. Class A phone lines are different from standard phone lines that they don't have any high cut locat on there. That's incredible. So, so from West LA into Hollywood, you right? <laughs> you just call the phone company, you know, hook it, hook me up, and they it'd be like I guess the old days when we were taking a train, we wanted to, the train to have the express tracks. But yeah, so we used Capitol Records for that, and and we mixed the record there. And when we started recording t- Tusk, uh, Soundstream Digital was a f- one of the first digital recordings. So they came over to us, and I called them. And I said, "Tell me about your digital. What's this digital?" And they had a a digital machine about half the size of this table, reel to reel, and it, it was very temperamental. It had a little guy 
that was sitting there tweaking the machine on when it was running. So we recorded all our stereo mixes on on digital, and uh, and uh, we, I did an AB. I had I had him come over and I recorded uh, uh, one of the songs, and I played it back for Lindsay and the band, and see if they could tell which they liked better. So everybody kind of agreed that the digital was nice. It's, we realized that it sounded, what we heard when we were playing the recording was what we played when, it's, it sounds different when you play it back after you recorded it because it was now coming from tape. But it, with digital, it, 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 we picked up a generation there. So even though it was 1644, we did, I didn't know that there was ever going to be 1624 uh, or I mean 24, 24, 16. I didn't know there was going to be improvements, but we were happy with that that we had that. But what I was getting confused about was that once we started having the digital machine, and when we wanted to start editing songs together or taking out the second verse or something, it had to be done on a computer. So and it was a massive computer. And it wasn't in LA, it was in Salt Lake City, Utah. So what we did, what we all did is we uh, took our tapes when everything was mixed and we flew back to Salt Lake City and edited them, the songs together and uh, made the running order. And, and if you did anything, if you cut 10 seconds out of the song, the computer would take eight hours to render. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, nothing was easy. And so we would have to go home and come back next day and then they do playbacks and I remember I, I had to fly back a couple times by myself to do fixes and so they, they said I had a Learjet waiting for me and I remember they, the band sent me a, a limo, came over to the village and I, I yelled out to one of my engineer friends, I said you want to go to Salt Lake City? And we have, I have a, a Learjet he goes yeah I, I'll give my jacket I said you got it now or never <laughs> so we just flew back in our private Learjet, but it was it was amazing, uh, and so we, the whole thing was done in, in digital, and and then we had to bring the sound uh, the 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 uh, digital machine in to uh, record uh, to Capitol Records, so they could we could mix it in uh, or master it from the digital. How was that? It must that have been fun. an endeavor. Uh, no, I mean, that was fine, but no edits. Right, no edits. Right. <laughs> How big was the machine? It was it was about this big. Right. Three foot square. Oh, okay. You know, weighed maybe 50 pounds. So you flew that down from Utah? Yeah. Incredible. But they didn't edit it. That, they used that basically to dump into the computer. And once the whole album was loaded into the computer, then they could edit Whatever, but it still took forever. So, I, so it was maddening when we were getting the run, running order. We wanted to fade out something just a little bit sooner or do a crossfade. Forget that. We're going to crossfade these two songs. Okay, well, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so, but. So all, all the things we take for granted in digital being so easy to do were actually hindering you in those days. Yeah, in 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 those days it wasn't. Now, of course, it's the it's the best. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. Thank you ever so much. That was an absolute pleasure. I really Warren, appreciate. Thank it. you very much. That was always fun. Yep. Well, we're going to do more. We were just talking off camera about a lot of other things we can do. Um, you're finishing up your room here, so we'll come back and do a full blown Atmos look through. We're also talking about pulling up the multi tracks of these incredible albums we're talking about, which would be insane. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. So stay tuned. There will be more. And of course, down below, there is a course that um, Mark, Daniel Nelson, who's sitting behind me. Say hi, Mike. Hi. That was the least enthusiastic. I know. He, <laughs> he looks worried. <laughs> so there's a course that Mark and Ken have done together, and there's a link down below. So please check it out. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ken.